Well, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining us for this Thursday afternoon resume program. I am Dylan Ryder from the Johnson County Library's Career and Finance Committee. We have the privilege to be joined by Karen Sillins from A Plus Career and Resume. For anyone who may not know, here's some quick information about today's presenter. Karen Sillins is a multi-certified, award-winning resume writer, career and business coach, and serving uh, clients throughout the US and internationally. Karen has held membership in the prestigious Forbes Coaches Council since 2016, has been published numerous times in Forbes Online and National Resume Writers Association expert articles posts, was chosen as one of 38 career experts to watch in 2018 on Twitter, is a frequent podcast, blog, and article guest expert, and is currently rated as a top social media influencer for employment, human resources, and recruitment on Agilions. She, re she resides in Kansas City, Missouri with her husband, Andrew, and their four, count them, four rescue dogs. So feel free to add your comments and questions in the chat to participate in our discussion. Karen will attempt to address your questions as time allows throughout the presentation. This program will be recorded for future viewing, FYI. Thank you all once again. Here's Karen. Hello, everybody, and thank you for spending your afternoon with me. Uh, I like to give people a presentation that really offers them actionable things that they can do, not just little overviews and things like that. So while there's a certain amount of overview, if you will, on the PowerPoint, the handout that you got, the PDF that's the outline, I will be following that PDF. And it has a lot of detail on it. And so feel free to print it out, take notes, whatever you want to do. It's yours to manipulate as you need to from the standpoint of uh, whether you want to put notes on it or on a separate piece of paper. So first thing we want to talk about is what is a resume really? And then what's your objective with it? A resume is not a resume anymore. It is a marketing document. And it's unfortunate that people still look at it as my list of duties and responsibilities. I get why people look at it that way. And it doesn't mean that your duties and responsibilities aren't wrapped into some of the bullet points. That's absolutely necessary. But what companies want is to see how you're going to benefit them. How are you going to be worth more to them than what they're going to pay you? Yeah, that's hard to hear, but it's true. You have to be worth more than what they're going to pay. And they have to see a great value in what you're going to bring to them. And the resume and the cover letter together can communicate that to them. So as far as an objective, we actually don't use objectives in the traditional sense that went on for so long. And you still see sometimes on resumes, on any resume, there's no, I want to work for a company that's going to give me, you know, uh, lots of love and I'll buy the world of puppy and I, I'm good at challenging environments and I understand Microsoft Office. No, we don't put that on there at all. No sentences like that. What we want to do instead is put a job title at top. And then we can talk about how we frame information just below it because you have some choices. You can have your traditional resume title, whatever that's going to be. And if you're going to a job fair, for instance, and you're an administrative person, then you can put administrative assistant, office management, whatever you want to put professional on there. And then you've got your general title that makes sense to everybody else that you're talking to at a job fair. However, when you are applying to a job online, use their title. That is a key word in their system when you're applying on an applicant tracking system online. You wanna use their exact title. And we're gonna talk about those formats here in just a second because those play into what we're talking about. So then the next thing that you wanna do is either put a list of keywords and don't put hardworking and problem solving. Those are not keywords, those are general characteristics. And a lot of people say they're hardworking and sometimes they're not. Uh, what we want to do instead is put things that apply to what we're doing. So let's say you're a marketing professional. What you want to have as your keywords are things about marketing collateral, ad campaigns, social media posting, things like that. That is what a marketing person does. 
You may be involved in the statistics part. You may deal with demographics. Think about the various things that you do that are specific to your job, not these little concepts of problem solving and you know all the different things that the fast paced environment person, whatever. Those are generic place cards in a job ad. They want to know what do you do? What has to do with your job? And we actually will reference a couple of books here later on in the presentation that will help you with that. Then we want to avoid a general resume. And what I mean by general, and I have a preference to keywords, just to tell you at the top after your title, for a very specific reason. If you want to use just a couple short sentences or um, you want to use a little uh, set of bullet points that has some of your biggest and best stuff in it, that's repeated somewhere in the resume, that's fine too. I'm just a keyword fan. It gives them a very quick reference to things. But we wanna stay away from general resumes. Why is that? Because general resumes don't tell them anything. I have people that say, well, I'm using the same resume and I'm applying for everything. They're not tailoring anything and they're not really adapting it based on sometimes very different careers. You will not have the same resume for landscape architect as you will for astronaut. And, and that is kind of a funny example, but it's true. You may be somebody who's excellent as a salesperson. So you may have your sales professional resume or sales executive or account manager, or however you want to phrase it for your more general title until you have theirs. But then after that, what you want to do is make sure if you're also applying for very specific marketing jobs, you have a resume that's tailored to marketing. You have a resume that's tailored to sales. If you're also going after higher level customer service management as well, because a lot of people go after two or three different job types, then you have one that's for customer service management. Don't confuse things between each other and have them all the same. Each one will have its own set of keywords and key phrases and certain things won't change. Customer service applies to all of those jobs, obviously, but it's different. Sales is about business development and cold calls and follow-up and all that kind of stuff. Whereas some of the marketing keywords I'm giving you from earlier, that didn't apply. And though you may cross-pollinate between jobs, that just means some of those bullet points stay in that resume. There won't be such differences to each of them that they're, you know, it takes you four hours to create the marketing version, but it still needs to have its own separate document. Then you can tailor it from there as you need to based on their ad, which we'll talk about. Also, the cover letter needs to be tailored. Again, you can do little things to it, but there should be a cover letter for marketing a cover letter for sales, and a cover letter for customer service if those are the three things you're going after. Do not confuse between all of them. Instead, there are elements that are shared and everything else is new text that you've created. Now let's talk about format and how long a resume should be. So I'm sure everyone out there has heard, you should have a one-page resume. Probably not. <laughs> I don't know other than college where this became the commonplace thing. You know, you should only have a one pager. And there are a lot of new college grads that do legitimately have a one page. It really didn't work while they were in college. They didn't have a lot of experience in other things. They really went to school, did their school, maybe had one little part-time gig at McDonald's and didn't really belong to any other associations. They're going to have a one page resume. But there's plenty of people, and there's one in my house sitting in front of me right now <laughs> listening to this seminar who will have a two-page. And there's a reason for that. They've had a lot of different jobs. They held multiple jobs during college. They just recently graduated, and they've held a job since then. That requires additional stuff because there are elements in what they've done in all of those that apply to where they want to go. They can have keywords and key phrases and tell a story about them. When I said a resume is a marketing document, I mean it. It tells a story. It's your marketing brochure. And you want to think about it that way. Every bullet point's valuable and where you place it and why you have it on there. So you don't need a seven page resume, but you still want to make sure you're giving them what they need. 
So you'll see chronological, functional, CV resume combination on the PowerPoint. The funny thing about that, and one of the things that I get a kick out of uh, is the things that you can now use when you're in PowerPoint. And there's a frowny face on functional for a reason. And so on the next page, you're gonna see an example of what you do wanna use, reverse chronological or combination format. And I even made up some bullet points on two of them just to give you an idea. You'll see on the reverse chronological, it's literally just going in reverse of your career. I was recently a sales executive for this company, July 2019 to present. And then I just generically put a bullet point there because of space considerations. On the functional format, that's not how it starts out. The experience section starts out with, well, I did some administrative and I did some problem solving and I got a bullet point for management. And then down below, or just a, a hodgepodge of bullet points, then below they identify their career history. That's a problem because they have no context if they're reading it as an employer to understand where you receive that experience, how recent it is. And it's a very typical thing people do whose experience is 10, 15 sometimes or more years old that they're trying to get a job in that again. And that is not the way to do it. Scanning systems don't read those right. And one of the reasons why everybody now essentially has to go into a scanning system, attach their resume, and then go in and put everything in that's in their resume again is because of functional resumes. They get so many of them and the system can't read it. The system is looking for the name of a company, a city and state. It's looking for the job title and it's looking for a date range of when you work there, preferably month, year to month. And the reason it wants that is because from an algorithm standpoint, it can easily go, that's a job. And then it's looking for bullet points under it. We don't wanna give paragraphs for a very, very good reason. And it, I can have a lot more fun with this when I'm in person in the class because what happens is people see things that's, that are paragraphs and they can be short paragraphs and they're like, I can't possibly read a paragraph, it's just too hard. You put a bullet point in front of that paragraph, they're like, oh, that's a bullet point, I can read that, that's fine. That's how our mind works. And we want to think, oh gosh, I would never do that. And yet they've done tests. <laughs> they've actually sent things to people, one with a set of bullet points on it, one with a set of paragraph, and you know, ask them what it said. And oh, they've got all kinds of detail about the one with the bullet points. They have no idea what the one with the paragraph said. Because we're so used to reading sound bites, bullet points to us are like sound bites. They're like little social media posts. So it makes sense. We want to go back to the other one. Um, the combination format is absolutely acceptable. And the only reason that I put this on here is because a lot of people have worked for the same company for a long time and they've held multiple positions or you've worked for the same company. Maybe you've only held a couple of positions, but you've done a lot of different things within the context of them. So I've given you an example, kind of how both of those work. You'll see, you know, made up Skylar Warehousing or whatever it says, Schuler, something like that. I can't see because but, uh, and I did it three weeks ago, but you have the overall dates you work there, July, I think it says 2006 to present, but then you have the operations director, the warehouse manager, the traffic planner, et cetera. And you've got the different dates for those. Anybody reading the resume now on the other end can see exactly how long you held different positions there. But putting each of those on a resume and then having to describe things underneath it is going to take forever in a day and make it look like these were each separate companies and jobs. And that is not something you want to do. Instead, you want to make sure that you give them overviews of things you did, probably in sets of keywords. Now, one of the things this person did was supply chain management, budget, and administration. So we have that. Then there might be another one that is specific to, and I, I, you know, employee management, another one for presentations, because a lot of people in supply chain management give tons of presentations on safety, on how to use a computer system, all this kind of stuff. 
Um, so there may be several different subject areas underneath with a few bullet points under each. Now, sometimes you say, I have some very related bullet points. You see there's one that talks about reduced 1.2 or no, I think it resurrected 1.2 million square foot warehousing unit. Everything that applies to that is sub-bulleted under it. It's a great way to break things up again without having 4,000 bullet points right in a row. <laughs> so it makes it easier. You know, one of the people that does seminars as well for the library, he will say, don't do death by bullet points. This is a way to keep ha from having death by bullet points where it's absolutely unequivocally related or kind of its own little subject area underneath one. You have an example of how to do that as well. Now you can go to the next one. So while you're looking at that and wondering what the yellow means, I'm going back to my step. Um, real quick, we're going to talk about color graphics on a resume. As you can see, even I even have yellow on this. And the reason that yellow is there is to give examples of keywords in the bullet point. But the reason I have this on the format, a lot of people like to put pictures and graphics and all kinds of things. Even an experienced graphic arts designer struggles in what they do or don't want to have on a resume. We'll often have a resume that's a traditional, more plain Microsoft Word version. Then when they go into the interview or they get contacted by the hiring manager, they'll send them a PDF of their pretty version, as they call it. That is really what you want to do. When you put graphics on a resume that you're trying to attach online, those graphics often, without you realizing it, sit in front of bullet points and do all kinds of weird things, cover up information, and half the resume is gone. You don't even realize it. If you are not an expert in understanding how to put things in front and making sure they sit correctly and Microsoft Word and then their system won't mess it up and all of that, I would be safer than sorry. Go ahead and create your traditional Microsoft Word, no graphics on it, but have the one that you have with the nice graphics that you can send them where you created a beautiful chart or whatever. That's perfectly acceptable. You could send it to them and say, I have one that's got a more graphic user to it uh, or use to it. It's got some different things about charts and stuff. And I, if you don't mind, I'd love to send you that PDF. They will take it. They won't have a problem with it. What goes on your letterhead on your resume? I don't need to give a visual for this. Your name and your name large. See where it says creating powerful resumes and cover letters at the top? It doesn't say really tiny creating powerful resumes and cover letters. You are what this marketing brochure is about. You're the company name, if you will. Put it as 20, 22, 24 point font size. There's a reason for that. You're the subject matter. And that's kind of hard for people sometimes, but it will pay dividends. What do you really need for an address? Now, if you really want to put your full home address on there, fine. But typically what they need to know is your city, state, and zip. They want to know if you're in the area or not. And it doesn't matter as much as you think it used to. Some companies, they're not going to pay relocation expenses regardless. So they could care less. If they want to interview you, they're going to interview you. Some companies have already anticipated this because of worker shortages. I have a client in biomedical who just got hired and she's going to be moving. They already plan to pay moving expenses for her. But city, state, and zip is all she had on her resume and her cover letter. Your cell phone should be a good quality cell phone line. And what I mean by that is when you're talking to them, please use a headset, earbuds, that don't make a lot of noise in the background and ask your friends if they do, or you hold it to your head. I know that's a little bit of a uh, you know, pain in the tuchus, if you will, but you want to make sure that they have good sound quality from you. If you can't do that or you can't trust that cell phone line, then you may need to get you a little track phone. If you do have a landline, like I do for business purposes, use the landline. That will always be a better quality of call. Then your email address, please make it professional. 
I've seen all kinds of interesting things, including Hello Kitty, cuss words in the middle of it, um, one that said something about see my nipple ring, uh, and yes, that was real. Uh, don't have those kinds of things in it. And if you don't have a professional sounding one, you go to Gmail and set one up. It's free. Just go to Google, sign in, go to Gmail. If you don't have a Google account, you can set one up real easy. Go to Gmail, set up an email in there. Make it easy for yourself so they can contact you and that you look professional. If they question you on an email already, that's a problem. And think your name and not your year you were born number. And I don't know why people's like, um, my name plus, you know, 67. No, instead, give people your name and maybe the last four digits of your telephone number or a year that is important to you, but doesn't have meaning as far as birth date. But I would be careful with that. Anything that has a year to it, they could wonder if that's you, when you were born or was it a graduation year or what was it? Instead, if you don't have to use numbers with it, I would do that. But if you do and you can't just put a dot in the middle of it or something and get away with it, Last four digits of the phone number or address numbers work very well. Lastly is LinkedIn address. And you want to make sure that you've done a URL on LinkedIn. That's appropriate. URLs are specifically tailored on LinkedIn if you know how to do it. And so you'll see up in the picture portion near where your picture is, though, over to the far right hand side. It will say, would you like to personalize how your stuff's shown on LinkedIn and personalize your URL? That's where you go and do it. And you will be shocked as to how often you can get your name. Sometimes you may have to put a period in between, you know, like Karen dot Sillins or something like that. But don't put on there, you know, Karen underscore Sillins with all kinds of letters and numbers after it. Then they know you don't know how to do that and you don't want to advertise it and then have a LinkedIn that's fully filled. Next is what should your resume include? So now we're gonna get into some of the stuff on these bullet points. Employment experience, obviously we wanna start with the most recent job first and work backwards, regardless of whether we're doing the combo or we're doing the actual traditional reverse chronological. And we want the employer with the city and state, a job title, the dates we are employed month, year to month, year, and here's why that's important. People go, well, you know, I, I just put 2020. What does that mean? I get that you may have only worked for that company for three months, but you need to put whatever those months were. So if it was July 2020 to September 2020, just put that on there. Don't be ashamed because you had a shorter term job, particularly with COVID and the great recession that was right behind it. If they can't understand that, you don't want to work for them. It's very important that we don't play the game of trying to make them guess what just a number means. Same thing when you put a range. Now, I get it when you're back a ways in your experience in 10 years, you might not remember exactly when you worked at some place. But when it's more recent after that, you need to provide month year to month year. Because what does 2020 to 2021 mean? Is that two days, two months, or two years? Make them question that and your resume doesn't get considered. If the person reading it on the other end of the scanning system, if it makes it past it, catches that, you don't get considered. If the person who's reading it as a hiring manager catches down to that, you don't get interviewed. Don't let that keep you from being interviewed. And then we want to lead with our best experience. So I've got some sample bullets here. A lot of people who say are in administrative work, customer service work, things like that, they'll put answered phones. What's that mean? Yes, it sounds plain and like it makes sense, but it doesn't tell them anything. But answer to five-line phone system routing calls to appropriate departments and building general inquiries does make sense. And that bullet 
has one, two, three, four, at least potential, and five may be answered, five keywords in it. The other has one, maybe two. And they like phone system because if it was a full-on system that had more than one line to it, you definitely need to tell them that. Or if you're working in customer service, that thing's a system. Yes, you may be receiving singular calls, but it's still a system. And the minute you're done with one call, another one pops right in for you. Give them enough information to know that they need to talk to you. Don't write these little generic bullet points. They don't help you. And they don't tell anyone anything. And leading with your best experience, if you're a salesperson or you're a manager, and let's pop up that next PowerPoint slide, and giving them the answered phones when you managed a bunch of employees, not the right order. So here it says manage 12 employees instead of just manage employees, including, and now you see all the different keywords and key phrases you could have. Sometimes, you have a few of these keywords and key phrases and you were a manager without the name. They like to give you jobs to do, but not always the title. Well, here's still some of the keywords and key phrases. Maybe you had hiring input instead of you were hiring, but you still got to be involved. Interview input, but that's still that keyword. So now we've got how many keywords? We had managed employees, that's two keywords. Now we've got managed 12 employees, plus we've got recruitment, interview, hiring, dismissal, performance improvement plans, performance evaluations and annual reviews, training, scheduling, mentoring, coaching, task assignment, goal setting, and general oversight. That's a bunch of keywords and key phrases, and they will be in their system if they're looking for a manager, period. There may be a couple of them that don't have every one of those in there, but they'll have a bunch of them in there. And I know this because I have access to those systems. I work with people who set them up. And I have lots of HR people as clients. I have two right now. They will tell me every time, yes, those are absolutely in our systems. And if they aren't, we populate them in there ourselves. So they're also entering other keywords and key phrases. Each system, each applicant tracking system where you apply online through a company, or through Indeed, or however you're doing it. That is what they're looking for. That's how you get, if you will, past the scanning system. Not white lettering or, or overloading your document with keywords and key phrases just because you want to try to scam the system. The applicant tracking systems are getting pretty smart to that. And people have found out they're banned from using the tracking system again. That's scary. Let's say you apply, I'm just going to, I don't know that this company does this, but let's say you're applying at Honeywell. And let's say Honeywell does that. And so you white lettered a whole bunch of keywords into your resume it, within the bottom of it. You just attach that. And, and what white lettering means is you make it invisible, but the scanning system could still see it. There are many companies out there that will say, okay, they're trying to cheat our system. They can't apply for any more jobs here. And you won't realize it until you go to apply again. And I've had people go, oh yeah, my friends found out they couldn't apply at a company again. That's That would be why. The other thing is, is you just get kicked out of the system. It'll just automatically kick you out. Give us the resume we want or don't bother applying. Some of them, yeah, you might get an interview, but they'll find out you don't have any of the experience because all you did was try to cheat the system. If you can't honestly tell them what you do and provide them that information, then you're gonna have a, a long job search and a tough one. And you can ruin relationships really fast if that person years down the line sees you at another interview and goes, well, they lied to me the first time, they're gonna lie to me again. And I have many job seekers who have told me over the years within the context of their career, a same interviewer has appeared at another company. Don't let that be you. So another thing you wanna look at is quantifiable numbers, names, creation of form systems and policies. And so go to the next bullet point or the next uh, one uh, on the PowerPoint. Thank you. 
See, it says oversee 500,000 raw goods inventory for lean manufacturing operations. You can put in raw goods inventory, but a lot of times you're cutting down sentences. And the reason that's cut out of there, because they'll still read it the way they need to, is because you can have fragments, fragment sentences in a resume and it's perfectly acceptable. So sometimes you're cutting out a little excess to get it up on two lines or just one line. And that, and, and I wanted to be able to make that point to you. If it starts to not make sense, then we don't want to do it. But this actually works. And so raw goods inventory for lean manufacturing operations, including receiving, warehousing, and production distribution, tracking via Microsoft Excel, and monthly audits. There's a bunch of information there that, again, are keyword heavy, but it also offers them a peek into what you really do and the amount of inventory you actually were responsible for. People really like that it makes a huge difference for them. If they don't see a real number, then they could make a judgment on you and say, well, how much inventory? And if you don't put what kind of inventory, that can be a problem. You know, you wanna say if it's raw goods. Raw goods is they're literally like raw stuff coming to build something or raw stuff coming that's commodity inventory. Right? Another thing you wanna think about is how you present a number. If it's below 10, so nine and below, typically that number is represented by spelling it. So nine is N-I-N-E, except for percents. I'd love to say that it will stand out when you put 9% and write it all out, but it won't. So the one thing we can get away with that's not necessarily Chicago Manual of Style Correct is taking the 9% and putting nine with percentage point, the number. But a lot of people like to put, say, instead of 500,000, they'll put 500K. The scanning system may still read that and people may look at it and not totally see what you really mean by it. Don't allow something to be mistaken when it doesn't need to be mistaken. Write the full number out. If it's 10 or above, it's not an exception. You put the whole number down. I have a client that I was talking to yesterday who is responsible for a project that's worth over a billion dollars. <laughs> a billion. All those zeros get people's attention. Oh, well, it takes up space. Not that much space. And it gives them this, woo, they see one billion. If you put one B, they may or may not see that. Make sure that you represent numbers appropriately. Now, for me, it doesn't matter if I'm scanning a resume for a company, whether you put that or not. But there are a lot of people out there who are exceptionally picky. And some of them are my clients and they'll go, oh, no, if I don't see that, you know, don't be eliminated from the process because you wouldn't do something that is correct in how you present it. So make sure those numbers, 10 and above, put the number. Don't put a B or a K or an M after it, put the number. Another thing to look at is that creation of systems and forms and policies. And in representing that, I want you to really think outside the box. Did you write any documentation? Did you create or co-create any forms, policies, manuals? Tons of people have worked on manuals, either done them themselves or co-created them. And they never put them in a resume. I was just talking to somebody yesterday. I was like, nope, that's going to go in your resume. You want to make sure that you give them what you've really done. But that's going to be too many bullet points. Well, there's not a rule that, well, you can only have four bullet points for a job. I know some people say that kind of stuff, but that is not true. And if you want to put little subject areas in there, like document development, employee management, just put the bullets that apply to each of those under it. Yes, it'll add just a little bit to the space on your resume, how much it takes up. But boy, does it speak to them. Because now it's separated apart. They can easily read it and they understand why you're of value. Let them understand why you can bring them value. If we hide those kinds of things and we say, oh, I can't have that many bullet points and all that kind of stuff, that's a problem. 
death by bullet points occurs because there's just 4,000 bullet points, no sub bullet points, no subject headings or anything, one right after another. Separate them a little bit, provide them a little context like the little subheadings. And now you've created the document that's gonna tell them the story you wanna tell. Because just because you only held a job for two years doesn't mean you can only have two bullet points. It's about what you did while you were in that job, not how long you were there within reason. Also think about from a number standpoint, representing it as the number you actually know it is. So that $500,000 in inventory, here's why that's important. A lot of people like to play a little game with that. Well, maybe it was 750 or, you know, it looked better if I put a million. No, there are people who read body language and they can tell you just lied to them when they start talking to you about it in an interview because now they're asking you for detail and you don't have all the detail and you think you're not giving it away, but you're giving it away. Instead, if you know it was at least, so I always say go a little low, at least 500,000, then give the number 500,000. Now, no matter what, you know you're telling the truth. And there's a huge value in that and your body language will speak to it. A lot of our communication is not about what we wrote on the paper or what we say. It's how we present ourselves. Now on educations, credentials, licenses, all that kind of stuff. Don't put your high school unless you are doing a resume because you just graduated from high school. High school does not need to be on there. But college degrees, or I went to college but didn't finish, that should be on there. Most people go to college, they drink beer and eat pizza and they don't stay. And that's not a judgment because we're asking 18 year olds to make up their mind what they're gonna do for the rest of their life and go be responsible with no one watching you. <laughs> we know you've been watched for 18 years, but congratulations, go do that. And some people can really do well in that environment. A lot of people struggle. And particularly because now we're with friends and we've got all these activities and, and you know, then we had the COVID thing and it, it just all kinds of stuff that chases people out. And every once in a while, it's really affordability. College is expensive. So just having to pay for it can be a problem. But you may have done two years of coursework, completed it, and you got enough to pass, well, then you have two years of coursework. And so instead, and I'm a UCM graduate, so I'm gonna use them as an example, go mules, or as one of my friends say, go mules. So what you have as UCM is University of Central Missouri, and then you know, Warrensburg, Missouri, pursued two semesters, two years, whatever it was, of coursework towards Bachelor of Science Business Administration. Even if it was general studies at that time, because you weren't sure what you wanted to do, you can say two years of coursework towards general studies. There's something about having college on there, even if you didn't finish, that really speaks to a lot of the people who might bring you in to interview you. According to the Bureau of Labor Statistics and recent census numbers, around 28, 29% of the population has a four-year degree. Now, as they start updating all those numbers with the new stuff, you know, there, it might have increased a little bit, but because of COVID, it might have gone down. Um, but the problem is what you're seeing with these people that think they have to have degrees for the person to work for them is that a lot of companies used to be in order to work for us, you must have a four-year degree and da 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 and this and this and this. And you still see some of those. And that makes sense for an engineer and a doctor and people like that. But now you're seeing a whole lot of this. Preferred, degree preferred, college preferred. That means, have you attended? So this is a great, great bunch of information for people to know. And for techies, it's getting even better. Because a lot of techies, you did a boot camp, you didn't go to school, but you did the KU boot camp on coding or whatever. Hey, there you go. You still have the university presence on there, but it's their coding boot camp. That is still education. I have a client who did 
a mathematics degree, but then he went on Udemy, and that's U-D-E-M-Y, who has a bunch of wonderful courses on there, and you have to pay for them, but they're wonderful courses. There's a few free, but most pay. And it's something that he wanted to do after we talked to become a business analyst, which is a really good job out there. And he said, I don't want to be a math teacher. Everybody thinks because I have a math degree, I want to be a math teacher or I want to be an accountant. I don't want to be an accountant and I don't want to teach. Um, so he went on there and learned um, SQL, Python, and he's learning R. So those languages all help you in analyzing different data and taking disparate, not desperate, disparate data, different data, and taking it and melding it into one set of information. Well, did they care where he got that experience? No. And he's working in corporate America, so it hasn't been a problem. Applying that kind of expertise to your resume where you've gotten recent professional development and things like that can really overcome the either I didn't finish college or didn't know. Guess what? I've got plenty of clients who never went to college. I have one she never even entered a college door ever, not, not even on a campus ever in her life for anything. And she said, oh, gosh, you know, I just, you know, I had this job for years at this hospital and I don't think they're going to hire me for the same type of computer work someplace else. And I'm like, yes, they will. Not only did she get hired, she got a job that paid her about 40 grand more a year. And the bonus every year for employees is double your salary. That's, that's almost unheard of. Now, that's special to her area and it's not common, but she thought because I don't have a college degree, nobody's gonna want me. Not so, don't allow that to keep you from going after what you wanna go after within reason. Like I said, engineering, doctor, things like that, they do want you to have to do. Licenses and certifications. Now, you another way to overcome things or amp up your resume is to get a license or certification in an area that applies to what you want to do. For instance, if you are in supply chain management, if you are in anything that has to do with the safety of employees, an OSHA 10 or an OSHA 30 certification always looks good. If you are a project management person, there's a scrum certification. That's a type of agile uh, which is the faster supposedly way to do a project. There's also and an, an a more informative way to do it with people actually communicating. But let's say you go, oh, I don't really care about Scrum, but there's a PMP out there, which is the project management professional. There are certifications you can get in it, and there's also certificate programs you can get in it. Sometimes that's through a university, but that can often be very expensive. There's also ones that you can find online from real accredited organizations, from places that really make sense and can actually provide this like Project Management Institute and will offer a good course for you that will get you to where you wanna go, get you the certification, and it's considered highly legit within the profession. So do your research. Do you really have to have the full certification? Because some of these certifications cost a lot of money. Or can you just do the certificate program? Next is professional development. Courses your employer sent you to, or they held internally. Conference seminars. A lot of times it's like, well, I go to an annual conference, and of course they'll have breakout sessions. You're not the person attending to the booth. You're actually attending the conference and going to the different sessions. You want to find out the last couple of years, what have some of those sessions been? How do they have to do with what you want to do? Either find the stuff from you going there or go online and look for it. It's almost always online if you look it up and you do enough research. Leadership and management, always good. Sales, customer service, compliance, always good. Computer applications, always good. You know, those kinds of things are... They, they kind of cross between so many different kinds of roles that if you talk about that you did a business development seminar, well, for customer service, that looks good. That still applies. In fact, what company doesn't want more customers <laughs> and more business? So go in, take a look at what you've got. Sometimes the company keeps track. 
and that's awesome. But those are usually really large companies. If not, go and look at what you've done in the last, say, five to seven years and really assess things that apply to where you're wanting to go or that cross broad categories like customer service. Then there can be courses you took yourself. Franklin Covey, Dale Carnegie, Skill Path Seminars. People go online like Udemy or community college courses. Those count too. If they are outside your degree, then they are a professional development course. And sometimes those courses allow you to actually get something like a Six Sigma Black Belt or a Six Sigma Green Belt. And for those in certain industries, that makes a lot of sense to you. And those are about how you analyze things and set in motion a more lean environment, if you will, of um, making sure a company doesn't have too much, say, inventory on hand, stuff like that. Military experience. If any of you are military or know people who are prior military who are struggling to get back into corporate jobs, one of the struggles that they face is taking their information and making it non-military. First of all, we're bad enough with acronyms and short name and things like you know, Benefer and things like that because we don't want to say two names. Uh, military is worse. <laughs> government, period. We love acronyms in the government. Well, you need to put it in non-military terms. And so it's okay to have the acronym, spell it out for them and tell them what that acronym is. The first time you use it, so I'm going to use, you know, OSHA, Occupational Safety and Health Administration, and then put OSHA in parentheses after it. And then after that, you can just use OSHA because it kind of explains what it does all by itself with the name. If it doesn't explain it in the parentheses instead, besides just the acronym itself, you might put a small explanation. And I mean, very small, a couple words, three words. Then there's things like they talk about staff but they also talk about soldiers or sailors and, and things like that. One of the things that you can do from a military perspective is to call them employees, staff, workforce. So using those different titles, if you will, of, of types of employees, instead of soldier, sailor, whatever, it makes it more corporate sounding, plus potential keywords. Computer experience. Software and applications, that's what they care about. Everybody kind of assumes today, and I know that that's an assumption that's not necessarily always true, but most people have been exposed to, if they've been in corporate America at all, Microsoft Office and Windows. But the problem is Microsoft Office is not explanatory enough. Yes, it could be a keyword in their system, but when they say Microsoft Office, they could mean the typical four programs that are in their head of Word, Excel, PowerPoint, and Outlook. But nowadays, for people with their home computers, it's Word, Excel, um, PowerPoint, and Notes, or OneNote. Okay, well, that's totally different. Which one do I put down? You know, and if they ask me, what do I tell them? Let's save yourself some time. You can have Microsoft Office in there in general someplace. But what I want to see under software or technical profiles, often a great place to you know place that information under that heading. Let's try this. Put Microsoft Word, Excel, PowerPoint. You probably use things maybe like SharePoint or Teams and then Outlook. List all of those. There are so many Microsoft programs. There's a CRM, which is customer relationship management. And so many of you may have used, say, Salesforce instead, then put Salesforce down or salesforce.com. There's Oracle programs that are separate. Don't just put Oracle, put the program you use. Same, and it could be Oracle financials, whatever. And it needs to be stuff you've used in the last few years. And I mean like three, four years. If it's outside of that, chances are you're going to really struggle trying to use it. Um, same with uh, SAP or any other ERP or MRP system. ERP means enterprise resource planning. MRP means manufacturing resource planning. Those systems have different programs or modules in them that you can use. Another thing to look at is technical and language skills 
that are outside of computers. For instance, if you are an automotive technician and you know how to weld, you are a much more valuable automotive technician and can make a whole lot more money because you can put on exhaust systems. Those have to be welded on. They don't, they don't just like, you know, put it in the slot. They have to be welded on. <clears throat> if you work in a lab, identify the lab equipment that you can use. If you are a computer tech that does other things outside of the traditional programs. So you're also using specific and dealing with servers and you're dealing with um, different antivirus programs and VPNs and all that kind of stuff. You could actually have several categories under technical profile and that is just fine. Then languages. People get themselves in a lot of trouble with languages. Languages are a problem because people don't identify fluency or they don't tell the truth about fluency. I have a client who speaks fluent Portuguese, Spanish, and English. He is originally from Brazil. And he tells the most hilarious story of what happens when people come in to interview to be on his Spanish speaking customer service team. He said, it says in the ad, <clears throat> must speak fluent Spanish, written Spanish in Boston. We'll walk in their office. He and the crew that are in there interviewing them, hola, and then they say something very specific to them in Spanish. And people just look at them half the time. And then they'll say something else to them in Spanish. And they'll just look at them. And at some point, my client will actually ask them, it said fluent in Spanish. Well, I had four years of Spanish in high school. Mm, you're 47. <laughs> you probably don't remember it now. Um, this needs to be a language you use. And there's different levels of fluency. Like LinkedIn has its kind of categories. I kind of go with light conversational, which means I can understand some things enough to communicate. Conversational means I understand a lot more subtleties and I'm much more, I have a lot more ability in the language. And then there's fluent. And there's fluent in the written and fluent in the spoken word. And you want to identify if you can do both. And that doesn't mean it's always a native speaker. And don't assume because their family spoke the language that they speak the language. My husband speaks very little Latvian. His family is from, uh, you know, a bunch of them that are, have passed on now from Latvia. That's where they came from. You know, and they spoke fluent Latvian. And like he said, I could understand a certain amount of it, but he said it was always kind of funny. They're speaking to me in Latvian. I'm speaking back to them in English. And it's very confusing to people who didn't understand what was going on. But if you're not using it in some shape or form on a fairly regular basis, the chances of you having a certain amount of fluency in it start to go away very quick. Please be honest. Don't get caught like my clients, interviewees do. Civic involvement, leadership and holding offices and being in that kind of more leadership role can be good, but you don't have to. What if you were just a member of the Rotary Club? That's a good thing to put down. Again, think last maybe seven to 10 years at the most. City Union Mission, United Way, American Cancer Society. But there's also one-time participation things. Susan G. Komen Breast Cancer Walk. My husband every year does the American Lung Association Fight for Air Climb. That's a once a year thing. And he's a participant, as in he runs upstairs, which is crazy because I can't do it. But he, he's very good at that kind of stuff. He's running up and down the steps. And they are having you do a lot of steps for this. And he does the unlimited, so he does a bunch. Um, there is real value to showing you participate in something like that. Companies want people who work for them that have an awareness outside themselves, whether that's Habitat for Humanity or going to harvesters once every few months and sacking groceries. Um, they're a member of an, uh, an organization, say like a church or a synagogue, or a temple, and I'm going to tell you how to deal with that in a minute, 
but it's not a religious, like I teach Sunday school or I teach Hebrew school. What we're trying to do is let them know we don't just sit at home all night watching television. We're active in our community. That's valuable and companies want that and they will go after people who do it. So be careful with the religious affiliations or things that sound religious sometimes. City Union Mission, you can get away with it, that nobody cares about that. Or Salvation Army, everybody's good with that. But what we need to see on, let's say, I'm going to use my own church as an example, Calvary Lutheran Church, CLC. A lot of masks in the uh, interview. They don't know. And then don't put a religious name under it. I run the marketing and communications committee. But above that, I'm on the parish administration. Well, parish administration kind of gives away church now, doesn't it? So we're going to want to say instead, facilities and finance. That's what we talk about every time. And certainly we have the marketing and all that kind of stuff we talk about, but it's overarching thing has to do with a lot about the money and the budget and even has a lot more to do with the facilities. <laughs> so that would be what I would put. It makes more sense. And people reading it go, oh, now I know what they do. So they're not reading parish administration. They're re reading facilities and finance committee. It makes sense to them and they can work with it. Political affiliations, if you're not applying within the context of a political organization, please leave those off. I do not have a problem what political organization you work with. But there are people that just get their panties in a wad about this and they see it and they think things that they shouldn't be thinking and we are very divided, leave that off. See, we can get away with the religious like CLC or you know, a friend of mine that goes to temple, you know, put BB, they don't know what that is. Uh, this is not a good time to over advertise stuff like that. But if you're applying within the context of the political realm, then yes, it does make sense. Um, the one thing I will say about acronyming things if they ask you in an interview, don't shy away from it. It's just fine. You can just say, oh, that's my church. And, you know, we're a larger organization or whatever, you know, your size is. And say, you know, this is what it's for. Oh, and you know what? When you're in the interview, they don't seem to care. I don't know what that is, but they read it on a piece of paper and they're like, I'm going to come here and talk about Jesus, you know, and so they, they throw it away. Um, the next thing, professional memberships. Same deal. If you have leadership or officer positions, please say something about that. Let a subcommittee, let a committee. But we want it related to your career. I am going to give you one association that I think most of you should join that has a lot of really neat stuff. And it sounds like a cool organization. It's called Human Capital Institute. And it's hci.org, very simple, hci.org. What you're gonna do is you're gonna go join hci.org, it's free. Click on sign in and it will give you sign into your account, join for free. You'll say, well, it's more human resources, some of it, but it's also about overall uh, employee engagement. There's things on there on time management, on dealing well with your coworkers. There's all kinds of different stuff on there. You may have to go hunting for a while to find some of those webcasts, but why not? It's a professional organization you can now have on your resume. And if you lack professional development, the webcast, not the podcast, podcasts are like 10 minutes, that doesn't count. But the webcasts are an hour long. Take those webcasts that apply to things that you feel are good to have on your resume and will look good for you or are keyword heavy. Some of them sometimes for what you wanna do or what you're doing are keyword heavy. And that's also nice. Take them, write notes while you take them. They may even have a little presentation with it while you're taking it. And they've archived, I don't know, six, 7,000 of them. So you've got a lot to go through. <laughs> that are really good. And some of it's just about returning to work, how to deal with being in a hybrid workforce. Well, that's gonna affect a lot of you ongoing now. Be mindful of it. Don't be afraid of having some additional things that kind of set you apart and make you unique. Oh, they belong to this association. And then if they ask you about it in the interview, be sure to share that it's free and they can join too. 
They make their money by certifications for human resources professionals and related types of professionals, but that doesn't mean they don't have good stuff for you too. Remember, go to the resources section after you join and, you know, put your last job on there if you have to. They don't know. Um, it's, it's because you're going to have a new job. You're going to have to replace it anyway or where you're volunteering. Put that on it. And then go ahead and go to the resources section and look for webcasts and have upcoming or archive and look in both. You might be able to attend one live and ask the presenter a question live. Speaking engagements and published work. Oh, people think I don't do that. I am not. I'm not going out to a symposium and speaking. Yeah, but you give presentations in front of other employees constantly. You are leading meetings and constant status updates and all this different stuff. Or you are publishing things internally, like that manual we talked about earlier, or policies or different types of tips documentation for people. There's a ton of stuff people write that other people use in a company or they use parts of it, Excel spreadsheets, PowerPoint presentations, all that kind of stuff counts. If you're creating that kind of documentation, you might wanna look at using that in the way it needs to be used because people hate speaking in public and a lot of people struggle with their writing. Just because you don't necessarily want to go speak in public doesn't mean you shouldn't tell people that you can do it. It makes you a more valuable potential employee. And particularly if their last employee that was in that position really struggled with it, they know you won't. That could be a huge selling point for you. Don't lose out on those great selling points that can make you more valuable. And then internships, if it relates to where you're going. Keywords, what are they? Well, they are a lot of different things. They're specific to the industry to a certain extent. They're specific to a job to a certain extent. But there's also cross-pollination. Like I said, customer service applies to a lot of stuff. Every place actually needs to have customer service. It doesn't matter whether it's the government, it's nonprofit, it's uh, an, a university, or it's corporate America. They derive money by making a customer happy. There you go. Another thing is the overall industry specific things that are buzzwords that are going on. So change management's a huge buzzword right now. Everybody loves change management. No, they really don't. But change management has some other buzzwords that go with it, like buy-in or employee buy-in, advocacy, creating advocates. That kind of stuff is big, big time if you're involved in that. So don't forget to include some of the bigger buzzwords that are going on right now. Yes, those may not be as popular later on down the road, but who thought employee engagement um, first of all, should have ever been a big thing because it shouldn't be a big deal to treat your employees right, but apparently it is. And employee engagement is something that is morphed over time, and there's a lot of it. There's a lot of different stuff that's going on with employee engagement. And so you've got all these different initiatives now that go on and things that you might have been involved in, and you may have even been on a work committee or something for it. Then there's the job related acronyms. So if you're in manufacturing, MSDS, that's a material safety data sheet. I'm using this product and it has a material safety data sheet that tells me don't spill that on yourself, that's bad. <laughs> and if you do, please call a doctor and go to the hospital, um, that kind of stuff. Make it easy on yourself and be sure that you define what that means. Think of keywords and key phrases that the applicant tracking system has in it that it's looking for in your resume and cover letter, like search engine optimization for a website. When you go and look up something on Dr. Google, as I like to call it, then you Google something specific, usually not just one word. You're Googling several things to try to get the information you want. And so... It might be a plumber, and you may say plumber, Kansas City, drain snaking, or something like that. That is similar to what an applicant tracking system does. It's looking for keywords like that 
but they're specific to that career, that particular job. It makes your resume more searchable and it gets higher results. So you're more likely to get past the scanning system so somebody can look at it. Where can you find the keywords? Indeed, look at job ads for your specific job that you're looking at at that moment. And let's say you have the three resumes. Well, let's start with one and go from there. So let's say it's sales. You're going to go to Indeed and type in sales executive, sales. You're going to type in um, it, like three, four job titles, if you will. Sales professional, um, account executive, maybe if you like sales management as well, sales manager. So boom, it's going to populate some things for you. Now, I am not concerned about necessarily, unless you're in a retail environment, the retail sales stuff. Go and find after those ads, all the stuff that's actually a real sales job. And go and just look and see what keywords and key phrases do you see over and over and over again in these ads. That is what we're looking for. And you'll go, well, I have that. Exactly. So it should be on your resume someplace. It should be represented in that resume. Yes, you could also talk about it on the cover letter, but it needs to be represented in the resume. Same thing with salary and job descriptions like salary.com. They often have some keywords and stuff in it. And use the freebie. Don't use the stuff you pay for. There's a book, actually two different books, by Wendy Enelo. She's one of the goddesses of our industry. And she was a mentor of mine, and she knows her stuff. Wendy wrote a book years ago, 1,500 plus keywords for $100,000 jobs. Then she upgraded it and wrote best keywords for resumes, cover letters, and interviews. It gives by section, finance and accounting, you know, and then, you know, manufacturing, warehousing. Uh, it has all kinds of different, different job types in there. And you go in and you look under the job type that relates, like sales, and it gives all kinds of keywords in there and a sentence of how they're used potentially in a bullet point. And you go, that's explanatory. So you know what it means. And you go, oh, I do that every day. I didn't know it had a name. You got a new keyword or key phrase for your resume. So use those. Those are great resources. And then Google or Bing. Use Dr. Google. Go on it and type in resume keywords for sales jobs. Boom. A whole bunch of stuff will populate. For specific keywords and key phrases to tailor a resume before you put it on an applicant tracking system, look at versions of how they do things on their app. For instance, they may have MBA and not Master of Business Administration. They may have B period, S period, Business Administration, or they may just have degrees in Business Administration, da 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 da, -da. Then it doesn't matter whether you put Bachelor of Science or BS. You want to put, though, what they're putting if they've got specific ways of representing information. That way, you get right past that particular keyword in their system. So if they use B period, S period, business administration as a sample of a degree that they want, that's what you use if you have that degree. Be diverse. Most of the keywords and key phrases are not in the ad. That's why you want to go through a bunch of ads and go, what's the commonalities? Let me think outside the box. What have I developed for the organization? Who do I manage? And what are all the keywords that go along with that? Because those keywords, chances are, in their applicant tracking system, each job that you apply for, chances are the applicant tracking system that you're applying in, just for that job, has 150 to 250 keywords and key phrases or more just for that job. And it doesn't mean you have to go figure out what all of them are and put them in there, but you need enough that will get you past the scanning system. And then you need to be able to explain how you use them in the resume. Don't just put keywords in there to put them in there. I am fine if at the very end you're like, okay, I think they, they put problem solving in there like 14 times. So you might have at the very bottom of your resume, below the education section, you might put something that says additional keywords and then put problem solving and a couple of other generic keywords or things that you want to add in. But don't just try to keyword load for things that you can't do. If you can't talk about how you do it, please don't put it in there. 
On resume organization, we see job title, keywords or qualification summary, professional experience. And the reason I say unless recent college graduate, every time I see this, I'm not, I don't want you to think you have to, but every once in a while, a new college graduate will put their education as the first thing that people see. And that's not necessarily a wrong thing to do, especially if you don't have professional development and all this kind of stuff. But usually when a person's looking at this document, they're going down to the bottom when they want to see education, credentials, your professional development stuff. It's okay to have it down there. But guess what you can do in the keywords up above? You just got your bright, shiny English degree, Bachelor of Arts English, up in the keyword section. Okay, so now you got it in two places. And that works. Next, verbiage, and we're going to go to the next PowerPoint slide. Action words. Oh, my gosh. There's so much stuff that people don't realize that they could use. But yet I'll see manage, 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 create, 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 create. And uh, the person that's here with me today that's watching this presentation happens to be a person who has a degree in English. And she will tell you, use a thesaurus. <laughs> It's your friend. And there's a thesaurus in Microsoft Word. But if you have to go get one, the library's got bunches of them. So they can help you out. Instead of manage, supervise, direct, execute. Instead of create, develop, formulate, design, build. There's so many other ways to say things. Don't be afraid of that. You'll notice that the one bullet point way back, and we're not going to go all the way back there, but in the PowerPoint presentation is talking about resurrected a uh, unit, a warehousing unit. That's a better action verb than just rebuilt. <laughs> no, resurrected. Brought it back to life, literally. So be mindful of action verbs that start sentences. But having said that, let's talk about passive versus active voice. If it's a past job, it will always be managed, created, supervised, administrated. It will not be developed or developing or build or building. It, you need to have it as past tense. But you can also have a current job there's past and current tense mixed in. Because guess what? If you already designed a PowerPoint presentation, uh, you know, 25 slide deck PowerPoint presentation on blah, 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 uh, for use by a supervisor, you did that. It's done. Unless you're going to be regularly going in and updating it, it's designed, it's done. A lot of things will be current, but for current jobs, it is okay to mix. When you're already done with it, you're not gonna go touch it again. Pronouns. In a resume, no, I, my, we, them, they. There are a lot of people, you start putting that in those, your stuff gets tossed out the window. Don't let that be you using a personal pronoun. Uh, no, I, my, we, them, they. But in your cover letter, by all means, it's personal. It's coming from you as a cover letter. It is a personal marketing document. If you notice in most brochures, they don't talk about we do this, we do that, except on that front page, it's like a little marketing letter where we at the ABC company, da, 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 da. That's your cover letter. So think about it that way. The rest of it's bullet points and pictures and all this kind of stuff to, to give detail. Your pictures, you're painting them with words. That's what you're doing instead of using a graph. Be concise. Answered phones is too concise. <laughs> we don't want to have a, a five line bullet point when we don't need one. Most bullet points are one to three lines at the most. That's pretty typical. Be specific. Don't say you did um, an increase in sales for uh, let's see, increase sales 20% year over year when you know the exact amounts for three years in a row of what you did. Increase sales, and then you can put fiscal year 2019, 
uh, you know, 22.3% fiscal year 2020. And it will look really impressive if you increase that for COVID time and then give that percentage. If you've got the exact percentages, use them. They're of advantage to you. Now, if this goes over 20 years, no, you don't need to give all of them, but maybe give the last three or four years and showcase what you've done. And keep it simple. If you don't use the word sesquipedalian in your daily verbiage, please don't go use it in your resume. Yes, there may be specific industry words and things like that that you use or things that are big buzzwords right now that are commonly used that make sense for you to put in your resume. But a sesquipedalian probably isn't going to be one of them. And by the way, that's a person who likes to use big words. Uh, it, it's not appropriate. And they're going to ask you what it means and you're going to go, I don't remember what it means. Oh, and I have had horror stories from clients that go, yeah, I put this one word in there and it sounded all fancy. And then they asked me what it meant. And I forgot. Don't let that be you in, a, in an interview. That's really sad. Let's go to the next slide. So common errors often, and sorry, my lipstick over time likes to go migrate other places. So common errors over time include not having a focus on your resume. There's no job title at the top. You just put your name and your contact information and boom, there's bullet points. <laughs> they don't even know what you're targeting. Well, I applied for that job. They should know. That's not how it works. If you're going to do it, do it right. So put that focus area at the top. Even if you don't bother to go in and change it to the right job, uh, their particular job name. So maybe they're calling it account executive instead of sales executive. Please have something so they know what you got, uh, what they're going to be reading. No cover letter. People will, nobody reads cover letters. Oh, that's so not true. I have clients who are everything from bank tellers and daycare workers. God bless them. I make the sign of the cross for them. Uh, all the way up to CEOs of Fortune 10 companies. I work with doctors, I work with military leaders, I work with political leaders, uh, you, you name it. But I also work with the staff that supports them. They will tell me once it gets starts getting to the hiring manager, the hiring manager and anybody above them, if the interview goes on and maybe there's a second interview or a third interview, often read the cover letter. Why would they do that? Because they want to see how you write and how you represent yourself. It's nice that you have the bullet points on the resume, but they figure if you made it past the first main interview, you probably have a lot of qualifications. Now they really want to see how you write. And that's what I hear from them. So do not do a cover letter that says the following. I saw your ad on Indeed and thought I'd apply because I feel I'm qualified. I'll find you. I'll make you stop that. Don't Please don't do that. So cover, and we'll talk about cover letters in a minute, but please be careful with that. Typos or grammatical errors are problematic. So here's how you overcome some of that. And it's in the tips here. Proofread, not just once, but several times. First, read it the next day. Then a few hours later, read it again. Second, wait for a few more hours, then read it out loud to yourself. If you have to post for it that night because the job's going away, I get it. But that's typically not the case. If you can't wait till the next day, there's a problem. Read it out loud to yourself. You will catch things that you never catch when you're just looking at it because our eyes read what we think we saw. And there's at least more of a chance to catch that that's not correct when you do it that way. But first start with just reading it, then read it out loud. Then read it backwards. Not a fun thing to do, I know. There should be periods at the end of bullet points. This is not a traditional outline. It's a definitive descriptions document. And if the PhDs who decided I could be a resume writer that was certified knew what they were talking about, and I'm pretty sure they did, they told me one of the biggest mistakes that they see is not having periods after those bullet points. I have periods after my bullet points because I knew that that was a different type of document and it needed to have, them. please put them there. You'll see you didn't include the period on one of them. You'll see double words. Every once in a while, for whatever reason, Microsoft doesn't redline that. I don't know why. So they won't catch and and. 
but you will when you read it backwards. You'll see misspelling sometimes that you didn't see otherwise that you think, well, Microsoft should have caught it. Well, it's another word. <clears throat> it's just not the word you want it. And you go, why well, wouldn't put that word in there? Now you can correct it. I know it's not fun, but it's very worthwhile. Then please have someone who knows how to really read a document and judge things that are grammatically correct and all of that good stuff, read the document, um, and, and can find spelling errors. It's very valuable to have somebody else read it, but tell them when they're reading it, you're looking for errors. You're looking for where you're missing a period. You're looking for where you use the wrong word or whatever. Have them look at it for that kind of content. You're not looking for their critique. Okay. This will really make it a lot better document. And I will tell you, most interviewers, if you have an error in your document, they're not going to throw it out the window because most of them, they go back and look at their resumes years later and they go, oh, I had three. And nobody ever said anything. So got a job. But the fewer we have, the better off we are. And if it's riddled with them, that's sad. I'll get resumes during resume critiques that are just riddled with tons of errors that are should never have happened. And I'm thinking, gosh, the person that purchased this didn't read it. Um, the next thing, don't overuse the same words. Remember, manage, 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 manage. Uh, responsible for duties included. Those are two of the most hated phrases by human resources. Please don't put those in. Um, there's plenty of other ways accountable for, they're, they're, you know, administrated, use other words. And then when they don't have periods after bullet points, people who know that's a rule go, why do they not have that? Paper fonts and envelopes. So it's rare you're ever going to mail something anywhere. So I wouldn't worry about that too much. However, what do we use? You don't have to use Times New Roman. You can use a different serif font, but there's a reason I'm subscribing to the serif font. Scanners work better off of serif than Arial, that's sans serif, or any of their related ones. And here's the reason why. Serif fonts have little tabs on all the letters. If you look at the little font things below, Callisto, Garamond, Georgia, and Book Antiqua all have little tags at the end. So on Callisto, the C has tags on the end of the top of the C. The A has a tag on the very end of the A going into the L, which has a tag on the top of it. That's how scanning systems really read documents and read them well and make fewer mistakes when they're reading them. Why would you give it Arial when it might not read it as well? Make it easy for yourself. I don't care which one you use, but remember, they're not all the same size. This is all like size 13 font, and you notice all of them are different sizes. So you write one, write it in one font and then don't like it and change it. It may totally change the size of the document. Be aware of that. The basic text goes in 10 or 12 point, 10 to 12 point font size. Um, like Verdana, oh my gosh, you can easily do 10 in that. But Garamond, you'd want to do 12. White space. People try to cloud or crowd everything into one page or I can make it, I can make it in two pages. I can do it, you know, not without deleting things. Stop playing this game of making it so overwhelming to the reader that they can't even function in their head of how to, how to start digesting the information. If you go into the interview, if you're actually going to see them and interviewing in person, give them a copy of your resume. Preferably on some nice paper, people go, well, nobody cares about that anymore. Mm, yeah, they kind of do. They like that impression. And I work with people who interview others all the time and they say they like it. Um, if you have to um, go in for the interview, I always recommend my clients take a nice envelope that's not a, not a folding one, but one of the big ones. And just do white or that really brownish orange one. They also call them like um, manila envelopes. Those envelopes are great 
for putting a copy of the cover letter you sent them. Remember, you're tailoring this, so don't send H&R Block to Walmart. Um, so put a copy of the cover letter that you sent them, copy of the resume you sent them, and maybe a copy of your references in there. And when you get in there, you may have written or you can put a something on there. It says your name, the company's name, and the position that you're applying for, and hand it to them. Find out how many people are interviewing you and always have a couple of extra. You'll be shocked as to how often they bring in extra people to the interview. I just had somebody like three or four more people came in. They were told, oh, there'll be three people. There were seven. They were shocked. Uh, that allowed them, though, to give a couple of extra copies to people. And it looked good. It looked really good. And so you just give them the packet. It's a marketing ploy. Everything they have from other job seekers that came in for an interview any of those candidates gave them something eight and a half by 11. You gave them something 10 by 13, nine and a half by 12, something like that. That's much bigger. And if they have something they really like that they want to put or the notes or whatever of you, you know, from your interview, they can put it into your envelope. It just makes you look really good, really put together. The word resume does not need to be at the top of your word of your resume. No need. They know what it is. Salary history, pull on a separate, a, a separate document. And usually if they're asking in the context of the applicant tracking system and all the 45,000 questions they want to ask you, that's where it will be in its own little separate section and they'll go job by job and they want to know your salary and all this kind of stuff. Do I agree with that? No. Is that starting to go away? Yes, because it's a way they discriminate against people and many states are starting to ban it. So I'm hoping that they'll ban it here as well. Indecisive or rambling objectives. You know, I want to work for a company that's going to treat me nice and is into this and into that. I'm going to buy the world a puppy. And oh, by the way, I can also do business development for you. No, none of that. Make sure that you give them what they're looking for, not about you. And that's one of the hardest things that can be communicated to people when they're thinking about getting a job because you're thinking I need a job or I need to leave the place I'm at and go get another job and that's fine however when they're reading your stuff and considering who to interview they want to know will you work for us are you the right person so it's not about you it's about their impression of you so it's about them Next, think about this very carefully. Please don't just put your references on everything. That's a no-no. Separate document, and you can give it to them in the interview. Now, every once in a while, you will have companies that will ask for them ahead of time. Things like school districts. School districts always ask ahead of time for some reason. But a lot of jobs won't. If they do, be prepared. Have the name uh, names of three people that you've worked with, worked with, not just anybody. You know, I, I get it when you're in high school, you may not have that. But if you're an adult, you've been in the working world, you have people who can be references for you who will talk about your ability to work. And they can be supervisors. They can be colleagues. Make sure they're well-spoken about you and they, don't, they won't say goofy things. And they can be employees. If you can't be their manager anymore, if that's the case. Also think about people who've left the company that you've worked for. You think, oh, well, I've been with this company for 10 years. I don't have anybody I can use. Who's left the company that you trust? Use them. You can also use clients and vendors or former clients and vendors to talk about your abilities. Just don't do it while you're working for the company, suddenly hitting up a client for it. Then you go for former. You don't need names of supervisors, full addresses of employers for the resume, but they might ask it in the scanning system. Be sure to have that information if you need it. Oh, but the company closed. That's okay. They can't get a hold of the person. All you have is the name and the company name. That's all you have. Personal info. They do not need to know that you have 10 children. They do not need to know what color your hair is. They do not need to know any of that stuff. They do not need to know all your personal hobbies or anything. You can share a little bit of that stuff within the context of the interview when they ask you, tell me about yourself. 
but let's not get into that here. And please still don't share that you have 10 children. <laughs> uh, the person attending here is just giggled at that one. Uh, please don't give that answer for tell me about yourself. References available upon request. That's just a space waster. They already know that. They already know if they want them, they're going to ask for them. So you're going to make them available and reasons for leaving jobs. You might have to cover that in the cover letter if you were downsized or your position was eliminated. That really does happen, as we all know, a lot more than we'd like to talk about. But we don't need to go into every job. If it's the recent one, you know, during a recent downsizing, da 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 da, da that way they know how you left. But it better be a downsizing and not a firing. Why do I say that? Very specifically because they're going to ask you the following question. So how many other people were downsized when you were downsized? When they fire people, that's usually a singular thing. When they downsize people, usually at that time or within the, those weeks prior and following, there's many people who start being let go. They're downsized. You'll also know you were downsized because you may get um, additional salary ongoing for a period of time and you can get unemployment after that runs out. If you're fired, they may fight your unemployment. And then think about this. If your job was eliminated, that is not a firing. But be very careful, if you really were fired, Please tell them you were fired. It will never be positive for you to lie to them. Sorry about that. I got to get rid of that lipstick. So cover letters, soft skills and definitive skills. Cover letters are really valuable. And it's a great place where you can talk about your soft skills. You can't really talk about those definitive skills you have on a, a you know, on a cover letter and resume and 45 other different documents without at some point on one of them talking about soft skills. Resume is not the place for soft skills. And soft skills go along with that. If you're not a good communicator, you're not a good project manager. <laughs> I'm sorry. If you can't communicate well, you're not going to manage a project effectively. But that communication and how you make that happen and maybe deal with the most challenging clients in a professional manner um, and, you know, don't mind things being escalated to you and all this kind of stuff. That's cover letter fodder. That's not for the resume. Paragraphs and bullet points. The great thing about cover letter is you can break it up a little bit. Do a paragraph, do some bullet points. And the bullet points can have, you know, if you've got a degree, a certification, some of your biggest and best stuff about managing employees, if you're a manager, that kind of stuff. Then in a couple of paragraphs, and the last one can always be that thing of, you know, you look forward to speaking to them concerning opportunities, and usually you'll actually personalize there and say concerning the opportunity of, uh, you know, whatever the job title is with your organization. The problem that people run into is that they don't close the cover letter. They just say, I hope to hear from you. No, give them a sentence that really makes sense and it tells them something. There's value in saying that you look forward to talking to them about the opportunities within their organization. And then you can say you hope to hear from them soon or whatever. It's like asking for the sale. I often tell clients in even just a thank you letter to say, you know, I look forward to the potential of a second interview with your organization or with ABC organization concerning the business development specialist position. That's a lot better than I hope to hear from you soon. <laughs> so give them a reason to call you back. That's asking for the interview instead, but not saying, hey, when are you going to hire me? Personalize when you can in little areas. And we've talked about that in the resume, the keywords, key phrases, things like that. But you might elaborate on something. Maybe they're really big on problem solving. You remember we talked about earlier, every once in a while you'll see an ad. It's like, okay, they mentioned that 17 separate times about problem solving. That's apparently a big deal to them. Then maybe a big focus of your cover letter is you solving problems. And that's personalizing to them. Does it mean some extra writing that you weren't planning on? Yes. Could it lead to a job? Sure could. 
No more than one page. This is the one page rule. And then avoid too many eyes and mys. You can start sentences with prepositional phrases. Don't end them with them. <laughs> Don't end with that, and from, and all, all of those type of things. But you can say, from the time I, da, 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 you can do that. We speak in a very different way from, the, from how we might do things in a cover letter. Since it's a bit for, more formal, well, business language, sorry, uh, more business language like, make sure that you give them business language. So you say things in a way that's grammatically correct, but you don't do the, oh, well, you know, I saw your ad in Indeed and thought I'd be a great fit. They will throw your stuff out. Uh, I hear a lot of complaints from hiring managers about that. And if any of you out there are hiring managers, you get complaints too. All righty. So the last couple things on additional tips, I already said, you know, don't go post it the first night, you know, or today. Spend some time reading it to make sure you can get it posted it. You're feeling the very best about that document. Each version of your resume should be modified based on that ad. Period. Those are minor tailorings. If it's a sales resume and it's a sales job, then there's minor tailorings based on keywords, key phrases, maybe a key sentence they used that you might want to use in a bullet point, then that's just fine. But you don't need to rewrite everything each time. The cover letter can have minor tailorings in it typically, unless there's some heavy, heavy area of focus. Never send one resume and cover letter at every job. That will result in almost no interviews. And remember, you can target more than one job type. You can have a resume that goes after supply chain management. And you can have a resume that's about leadership and management. It may be in operations, but it's specific to management. Whereas supply chain may be more about the warehousing and all that kind of thing. Don't fear having more than one version. You don't need 10, but most of you, as you know, have multi, I would say varied experience. Let's put it that way, varied experience. You haven't done just one thing. And this gives you that gift of targeting more than one thing, particularly in an economy that's struggling a little bit. Some companies are downsizing. Some companies aren't fulfilling what they said. They're sending out a letter saying they want to hire you and then they're rescinding it. And that is really happening. I, I've shared a couple of articles about that on LinkedIn. This is disturbing, but if you've got your, your net cast wide, you're going to get something sooner and you're going to have more to choose from. So you don't have to just stick to just administrative. If you've got marketing skills with it, then you can go after marketing assistant, you can go after administrative, you can go after office manager, et cetera. Now you've got several different job types you can go after. And if you don't mind doing a lot of personal stuff for a particular person in a leadership position, usually CEO, COO, somebody like that, could even be potentially an executive assistant. This will get you further in your job search quicker. And the whole idea is to get a job, to get the right job, but also not to ignore parts of your skills where you love that work and you just didn't go after it. Unless for some reason it just doesn't pay at all. Don't be afraid to go after that kind of work. So any questions? Yeah, we do have a few here, uh, but real quick before we get into the Q&A, just want to ask everybody who's still here to think, uh, you know, please take a moment to chime in on the chat to thank Karen for taking the time out of her busy schedule uh, to share all this excellent information. Um, and while you are doing that, I want to let everybody know our next career and finance program will cover the topic of LinkedIn, um, which we will also get to uh, in the Q&A session uh, following the conclusion of this recording. Now, our upcoming LinkedIn program 
will be an hour long session and it will feature Kansas City's own Women's Employment Network. That will take place at 1.30 p.m. on Wednesday, July 6th. You can visit jocolibrary.org and click on the career and finance feature on the homepage to discover uh, that programming uh, or that program, other upcoming events, uh, sign up for our monthly career and finance e-newsletter so you can stay abreast of everything that we have going on uh, related to career and finance. Um, and of course, find additional career and finance resources as well as uh, our recorded programs. Um, you can find those either through our website and that career and finance page, or just visit youtube.com slash joco library. Thank you all once again, and have a great afternoon.